Hello everyone, this is Dr. Singaram. Welcome to the discussion of FMG December 2021 question asked in pediatrics. This year questions were very straightforward and easy ones and I hope that most of you who have attended the exam should have been able to answer most of them correctly and should be able to clear the exam with ease. I wish you all the best uh, for the results. I would also like to thank students who have contributed to this particular questions uh, and um, we will discuss the questions with relation to options which I have got from the students. Remember that these are recall questions so there may be some discrepancy between the actual question or the options but uh, with uh, whatever questions we have and the options collected we will try to discuss and will benefit from uh, will benefit the maximum out of it. So let us start with the first question. The first question is regarding which of the following condition is an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. A very very standard question which all of you should be knowing about. Uh, look at the first option. Hepatitis C. Remember Hepatitis C is not transmitted by breast milk. Uh, it is related to blood transmission related and the sexual transmission. So it is not going to be a contraindication for breastfeeding. In fact all the hepatitis viruses are not going to be transmitted to breast milk. So they are not contraindication for breastfeeding. Next is regarding cytomegalovirus that is also not going to be transmitted by breast milk hence not a contraindication. Look at the last option herpes simplex. Of course the cycles if they come in contact with the baby there is a possibility of transmission but very clearly given in the question herpes simplex without involvement of breast. So that itself tells you that it is not a contraindication for breastfeeding. So what is the answer for the question? It is going to be galactosemia which is one of the metabolic disorders wherein the baby is not able to utilize the galactose. So when the milk is given, milk contains lactose which would be broken down into galactose but that galactose cannot be converted into glucose and instead it starts accumulating in the organs causing organ damage. So that is why galactosemia is an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. You should also remember one more important condition which is an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding that is congenital or primary lactose intolerance where the baby is not able to digest lactose. So these are two important metabolic conditions in the baby which are absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. You should also remember what are the maternal conditions which are absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. If the mother is having a carcinoma and undergoing chemotherapy or radiotherapy then that is also a contraindication for breastfeeding. Okay. These are the usual absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. At this point I would want you to remember that HIV infection in Indian scenario is not an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. It is just a relative contraindication for breastfeeding. In the sense that if the mother is not able to afford other milk like the formula milk and she can only breastfeed the child, she is allowed to breastfeed in Indian scenario. That is a point to be noted. Only thing is if she is breastfeeding, she should take antiretroviral treatment and the baby should take prophylaxis with heavy rubbing. These are the ones which should be remembered. HIV is a relative contraindication and not an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding. So that's about the first question. Let's move on to the next question. A 7 year old child presented with complaints of hematuria with history of sore throat two weeks back. On assessment, no fever and cola colored urine was noted. What is the diagnosis? It's a very, very typical case. You see here, this child is presenting with hematuria. Okay, and to substantiate our diagnosis, what else is given? The child is also having a cola colored urine. Okay, child is also having a cola colored urine. Please remember this, whenever we have hematuria with cola colored urine, the number one possibility is glomerulonephritis. Okay, if they want to make you think about glomerulonephritis, they can either mention cola colored urine or they could mention some microscopic abnormalities. Microscopic abnormalities favoring glomerulonephritis would include presence of dysmorphic RBCs. That means abnormally shaped RBCs. When at least 20% of the RBCs are abnormally shaped, then it is suggestive of glomerulonephritis. One more thing is presence of RBC cast. These are the other ways in the question they can give you a clue to make you think about glomerulonephritis as a cause of hematuria. In the presentation. Now look at this question. This is a child 
seven year old child along with a very important history of sore throat two weeks back very very classical history this sore throat in the setting of glomerular nephritis is probably related to streptococcal pharyngitis yes we are talking about which streptococci absolutely correct it is group a beta hemolytic streptococci that is what we are talking about that streptococcal infection classically manifest as pharyngitis and following pharyngitis one to two weeks the child presents with glomerular nephritis what do you call this condition and the answer for this question it is post streptococcal glomerular nephritis psgn is the diagnosis please remember psgn is the most common condition associated with glomerular nephritis in children gn refers to glomerular nephritis a very very important clue to this question is the age of the child the typical age group uh, in which psg occurs is school going children which is between 5 to 15 years of age please remember regarding the other options membranous nephropathy and minimal change disease they are going to be associated with not uh, glomerular nephritis instead they are associated with nephrotic syndrome okay one confusing option could be iga nephropathy but please remember iga nephropathy is associated uh, with um, a uh, hematuria following is a uh, respiratory infection but it is not one to two weeks instead it is one to two days that is a point to be noted that is one of the distinguishing points which is always given in the question so the answer is not going to be ig nephropathy clearly the answer for this question is post streptococcal glomerular nephritis let's move on to the next question which is a one liner question straight forward question as well level of ending of spinal cord in infants it is l3 okay if the question is asked as newborn then also the answer is l3 only after infancy that is in older children it ends at the level of l1 to l2 l1 to l2 if the question is about older children these are the straight forward fact based question which you should know about let's move on to the next question the next question is regarding a 10 month old child who is undergoing treatment for diarrhea uh, and also noted to have hypokalemia however in spite of potassium correction the child does not improve and the floppiness is noted which of the following condition should be considered please remember here the question is about a child under treatment for diarrhea always remember in a child with diarrhea there is some amount of hypokalemia which is definitely possible because loose stools contain lot of potassium but please remember this is only a mild hypokalemia in most cases Uh, so the ors which we are giving as a treatment by itself contain potassium that would normalize the potassium levels however in some children it may be little severe maybe due to lot of loose stools or more duration of loose stools that hypokalemia can become little severe so they may require potassium correction as well in this particular child it was little severe so that is why potassium correction was given but unfortunately even after potassium correction you see the child's condition does not seem to improve not improve as well as floppiness is noted which is again suggest of muscle weakness which can be a feature of hypokalemia now in this particular setting what other abnormality also will you consider albumin deficiency phosphate deficiency calcium deficiency magnesium deficiency are the options okay i'm sure that um, two options are the close um, calls in this particular question uh what are the two options yes it could be either calcium deficiency or magnesium deficiency no way albumin deficiency and phosphate deficiency is related to the presentation given in the question so they are going to be obviously out it can be calcium deficiency or magnesium deficiency which one presents with floppiness or muscle weakness that is the clue we all have studied that calcium uh, deficiency typically presents with tetany okay no signs of tetany are given in the question so that also can be ruled out so the answer is automatically going to be magnesium deficiency or hypomagnesemia yes hypomagnesemia can be associated with muscle weakness so that is why this child was not improving even after correction of potassium okay right please remember how hypomagnesemia occurs in this scenario that is the next question to be answered generally remember when you study about hypomagnesemia in pediatric population there could be only two possibilities one is decreased intake which is what we see in cases of malnutrition okay straight forward malnutrition 
or it could be due to increased loss excessive loss excessive loss that loss could be from the gastrointestinal tract say for example a child who is having diarrhea or recurrent vomiting or it could be from the um, renal kidney okay uh, example uh, something related to use of thiazide diuretics or a very rare uh, tubular inherited tubular disorder called gittelman syndrome which also cause increased loss of magnesium from the urinary tract in this particular question we have a child with diarrhea which is contributing to gastrointestinal loss so very well this particular child may also have a associated magnesium deficiency that is a point to be noted okay so you can see these are the lines taken from copy guide textbook which very clearly tells you about uh, magnesium depletion magnesium deficiency are the answer for this question see here magnesium depletion is often associated with hypokalemia hypomagnesemia and metabolic acidosis so definitely magnesium deficiency is correlated with hypokalemia that is the first point second point very important point uh, as a result hypomagnesemia is sometimes difficult to attribute solely to specific clinical manifestation even though we study floppiness or muscle weakness as a feature of magnesium deficiency it can very well be a presentation of hypokalemia as well so that is why it is very clearly given hypomagnesemia is difficult to pick up so is difficult to pick up solely based on clinical manifestation so that is why please remember in a child with a diarrhea as well as having floppiness or muscle weakness number one possibility is hypokalemia number two possibility is going to be hypomagnesemia these are the learning point from this question which you should know about slightly tougher question but if you go with logical thinking and eliminating the option you should have come to the answer for this question right let's move on to the next question uh, again a straightforward question in a child presenting with fever and following appearance which condition should be suspected uh, you can see that the child is having some redness in the face region especially you can notice in the cheeks very classical in the cheeks you are noticing redness okay what we call it as slapped cheek appearance slapped cheek appearance very very classical condition which condition is associated with slapped cheek appearance it is going to be erythema infectiosum okay which is a classical uh, infectious condition caused by parvovirus b19 parvovirus b19 infection okay a very typical presentation of slapped cheek appearance please remember in erythema infectiosum the initial presentation is with fever and uh, some uh, viral prodrome okay like for example upper respiratory infections can occur but just two three days after the fever child starts to develop this characteristic slap cheek appearance okay initially it starts in the face and intense in the cheek that is why it is called as a slap cheek appearance after the um, after the face is uh, involved what happened the rash spreads to the rest of the body okay and in that say for example the trunk and the extremity that is where it is going to spread now when it spreads what happens is that the center area becomes clear okay this is what we call it as a lazy lazy l a c y lazy reticulated appearance of the rash lazy reticulated appearance of the rash okay this appearance of the rash is what we see over the trunk and extremities in the face it is called as slap cheek appearance rest of the body it's called lazy reticulated appearance these are two very important questions which they keep asking about this erythema infectiosum let's move on to the next question the next question is about a 3 year old child presenting with fever and cough along with inability to feed for 2 days on examination chest in drawing is noted with respiratory rate of 42 per minute what is the severity grading of respiratory infection in this child no pneumonia pneumonia severe pneumonia very severe pneumonia please remember this is a very standard and a repeatedly asked mcq question which we emphasize so many times as an important important topic for your exams okay please remember according to um, the severity grading of respiratory infection there is no term called as very severe pneumonia so that option is absolutely out so you have to choose from the next three option no pneumonia pneumonia and severe pneumonia please remember let us try to look at the option look at the um, look at the scenarios given in the question what is that first is the age of the child 
three year old child who is having fever and cough which can be noted with any respiratory infection okay right our main points are to look at the respiratory rate you look at the respiratory rate it is given as 42 per minute whether this is fast breathing or not for a three year old child definitely this is fast breathing okay i hope all of you know that in the first two months breathing rate more than 60 per minute is called fast breathing 2 to 12 months more than 50 per minute is called fast breathing and after one year it is more than 40 per minute is called fast breathing so this is a three-year-old child with a respiratory rate of 42 per minute definitely fast breathing is present in this particular child second important clue which is given in the question is child is also having chest in drawing which is chest retraction that is also present in this particular question whenever fast breathing or in drawing is present it automatically is either pneumonia or severe pneumonia okay so how are you going to differentiate between the two that is based on presence of danger signs we have studied about some danger signs what are the danger signs we have studied about we have studied about yes a child who is having cyanosis convulsions lethargic not able to feed or drink in this particular question one danger sign is given what is that danger sign child is not able to feed very very important clue danger sign is also present in this child okay so whenever danger sign is going to be present automatically what is the classification yes that is going to be severe pneumonia definitely this child should not be treated in the community and should be immediately referred to the hospital that is what you need to know about okay right let's move on to the next question which of the following condition is associated with hypocalcemia to tetralogy of fallow which is a congenital heart disease thymine hypoplasia and micro deletion in chromosomes 22q11.2 it's a very straightforward question nobody can give you so many clues to arrive at the answer yes it is straightforward a case of very good a dijorge syndrome Dijorge syndrome is one of the micro deletion syndromes micro deletion syndrome that is what is already given in the question the important chromosome is long arm of the chromosome 22 okay very important feature is this condition is usually remembered by the acronym what is that acronym a very important acronym which all of you know it is catch 22 22 refers to the chromosome what is that catch c refers to cardiac defects or the congenital heart defect one of the congenital heart defect could be tetralogy of fallow that is already given in the question next is a is for abnormal facial appearance abnormal facies what about the next one t is for thymic hypoplasia which is again given in the question okay now c is for cleft these children can have cleft lip as well as cleft palate and H is for hypocalcemia. The reason for hypocalcemia is because the parathyroid gland is not developed properly. There is hypoplasia of the parathyroid gland which could lead to decrease in the levels of parathyroid hormone and that is going to be associated with hypocalcemia. So very straightforward question. It is Dijorge syndrome. Let's move on to the next question. An infant with the following presentation. Which of the following, which of the embryological abnormality should be suspected? First of all, what is the clue which is given in the question? You can see that particular uh, baby is having absent development of the head, that is the skull, as well as no obvious brain tissue is present. So this is a condition characterized by, very good, all of you know the answer, this is nothing but anencephaly is what they have asked in the question. So you are going to tell about the embryological origin of anencephaly. Very straightforward again, we all know that anencephaly is one of the neural tube defects. Okay, neural tube defects are classified into two varieties. One is called as a caudal neural tube defect and cranial neural tube defect. Okay, right, cranial means upper, caudal means lower. Anencephaly is one example of cranial neural tube defect. Okay, right, here is the point. We all know that neural tube defects are due to failure of closure of neuropores that is what we all know about okay cranial neural tube defects are due to failure of closure of anterior neuropore right and caudal neural tube defect example like spina bifida is due to failure of closure of posterior neuropore okay so 
very obviously for this particular question the answer is going to be failure of closure of anterior neuropore because posterior neuropore closure will result in caudal neural tube defect it is not a neuronal migration defect anyway total closure of the neuropore will result in combined upper as well as lower neural tube defect what we call it as cranio rachi skysis cranio rachi skysis in this particular question only upper neural tube defect is given so the answer is failure of closure of anterior neuropore that's all next question in a neonate there was discharge of meconium from the umbilical stump which of the following condition should be suspected whether patent uracus patent vitello intestinal tract omphalocele or urethrocele please remember i will tell you the straightforward answer for this question urethrocele no way is going to have an external communication you can detect it only by imaging of the urinary tract so that is not the answer in omphalocele what happens is that the intestinal contents or the intestines come out but they will be covered with a sac so there won't be any discharge of meconium to outside so definitely that is not the answer for this question it has to be either patent uracus or patent vitello intestinal tract please remember in patent uracus there is a communication between the umbilicus and the bladder so what is going to happen in patent uracus there would be discharge of urine and not discharge of meconium so that answer is also automatically out so the answer for this question is going to be patent vitello intestinal tract okay the other name for the vitello intestinal tract is omphalo mesenteric duct it is omphalo mesenteric duct normally uh, this is a duct which connects the yolk sac to the midgut of the developing fetus normally this is an embryonic structure which will disappear by 4 to 5 weeks of gestation itself after that it will not be present and usually if this vitello intestinal tract or the omphalo mesenteric duct is going to be persisting or patent that results in a communication between the umbilicus and the intestine okay unfortunately if that entire duct is going to be patent what is going to happen the contents of the intestine can come out through the umbilicus that is what we are seeing as discharge of meconium from the umbilical stem okay and what will you call this exact communication between the umbilicus and the uh, intestine you call it as vitelline fistula okay you call it as vitelline fistula vitelline fistula is complete patency of the uh, vitello intestinal tract and through that fistula the contents of the intestine uh, meconium can come out that is what you need to know about okay these are some important examples of persistence of vitello intestinal tract when the entire duct is patent that is what i was telling you it results in vitelline fistula the center part of the duct is alone patent it will result in vitelline cyst sometimes it is not a patent communication but just like a cord like structure we call it vitelline cord and one more very important is if the proximal portion of that duct the vitello intestinal duct is going to be persisting it forms a diverticulum called meckel's diverticulum which is one of the important gastrointestinal anomalies okay meckel's diverticulum remember only when the proximal portion of the vitello intestinal duct is going to be patent okay sometimes you can get a combination of meckel's diverticulum as well as vitelline cord that's not very common so two important things which you should be knowing about for your exams are one is vitelline fistula second one when the entire duct is patent only when the proximal portion of the duct is persisting it is going to result in meckel's diverticulum so for your exam purpose in the future exams just remember two important things as uh, patency of the vitello intestinal duct one could be vitelline fistula second could be uh, meckel's diverticulum these are the two points which i want you to remember for your upcoming exams okay right let's move on to the next question a 5 month old child presented with difficulty in breathing chest in drawing and wheezing of one day duration uh, the next line is not very clear some of the students said that previous episodes of wheezing uh, or previous uh, usage of mda that is meter dose inhaler is also present okay some of the students were saying both were given in the question some were saying only one was given in the question anyway there is something which is a significant previous history of wheezing or meter dose inhaler usage what is the next step in the management of this condition okay um 
first of all remember whenever there is a previous history of wheezing and this time also child is presenting with wheezing you have to strongly consider the possibility of asthma i will tell you a clinical clue that asthma should be considered in a child who is having recurrent episodes of wheezing what i mean by recurrent more than or equal to 3 episodes of wheezing then you strongly consider the possibility of asthma this is what i want you to remember so this is probably a case of asthma and child is presenting with an attack of asthma what you call it as an acute attack of asthma okay child is presenting with an acute attack of asthma so question is how are you going to manage this acute attack of asthma always remember the number one thing which you should always always give for a child is salbutamol nebulization definitely salbutamol nebulization is something which we will always try okay in fact parents who are using uh, meter dose inhaler for their child with asthma are advised to give one puff of this meter dose inhaler uh, salbutamol mda from the home itself when the child is having an acute attack okay so definitely salbutamol nebulization should be given very important uh, for this particular child so answer has to be uh, oxygen inhalation along with salbutamol nebulization okay some students were not giving a correct options they were just con slightly confused in the option so i will try to clear uh, what all could be the possible options or what all could be the possible scenarios which you can encounter in case of an acute attack of asthma generally remember an acute exacerbation what we call it as the acute attack of asthma can be classified into different grades of severity mild or moderate and severe okay just remember that if there is no chest in drawing it is called as mild attack of asthma if there is presence of chest in drawing then it is called as either moderate or severe attack of asthma then how are you going to differentiate between the two conditions okay please remember in mild attack of asthma spo2 is going to be normal whenever i say normal it means spo2 of more than 95 percentage is called normal okay now in moderate and severe asthma obviously it is going to be lesser if spo2 is between 90 to 95 percentage then it is called moderate asthma okay right and if the spo2 is less than 90 percentage then it is called as severe asthma that is a point to be noted okay now coming back to the question this question was very clearly telling you that the child was having chest in drawing so this should be definitely a case of a moderate to severe attack of an asthma okay right now let's discuss further suppose this is only a mild acute asthma then the immediate intervention is going to be salbutamol nebulization that's all salbutamol nebulization that's all however if this is going to be moderate to severe attack of an asthma already this child is having hypoxia so definitely oxygen inhalation should be given along with that you can give nebulization of salbutamol that is what you need to remember okay right is that clear and according to the books we should also start a short course of oral steroid which is oral prednisolone whenever i say short course it is like 5 to 7 days it has to be tapered over 5 to 7 days this is what is the guideline okay so probably the best answer for this question is oxygen plus nebulization of salbutamol along with starting oral prednisolone that should be the best answer but according to the given uh, options i would choose the answer as oxygen nebulization plus salbutamol nebulization is that clear right okay now you should also know about one more very very important which is supposed to be the most severe form of an attack of asthma what we call it as life threatening asthma when will you consider life threatening asthma presence of any one of the following what are they presence of either cyanosis or silent chest you are not able to auscultate anything that's called silent chest or child having altered sensorium and very very poor respiratory effort okay if any one of these signs is present then it is called life threatening of asthma obviously these children spo2 is going to be low so in case of life threatening asthma what are the things you are going to do okay very important this can be one of your future questions as well please remember immediate oxygen inhalation has to be given 
Second thing is nebulization. Of course, salbutamol has to be given, but along with salbutamol, you also have to add ipratropium nebulization. That is a point to be noted. Not just salbutamol, salbutamol plus ipratropium nebulization. And in this particular condition, you are supposed to add injection hydrocortisone. You have to give the first dose of injection hydrocortisone immediately. Okay. One more important medication advised in the management of life threatening asthma is injection of terbutalin or adrenaline. These are the guidelines for life threatening asthma. One of the possible future exam questions should make a note of it. Okay. So moving on to the next question, fat sugar baby appearance is noted in again a very very straightforward question. Which condition? Yes, the answer is going to be Korshoker. It is going to be noted in Korshoker. We all know that in a condition of Korshoker, there is severe protein deficiency. Okay, protein deficiency. And uh, in this particular condition, we all know that there is a lot of edema present in a child with Korshoker. Okay, right? Something like this picture where you have the child with the distended abdomen and edema all over the body which was actually one of the questions asked last year okay uh, or last exam I suppose okay which was one of the questions asked in June 2021 um, FMG exam okay where they show a child with a, a distended abdomen and asked you about what could be the condition and what could be the deficiency it was for shoker with severe protein deficiency that was the question asked okay right and because of this um, because of this distended appearance only it's called as a fat sugar baby right Okay, what is the typical age group? Please remember, Quarshyokar generally is between the age of 1 to 4 years or in general, after 1 year only, the manifestations will start. In contrast, in marasmus, even less than 1 year, the manifestations will start. Appearance is what is the question which was given? It is fat sugar baby appearance, fat sugar baby appearance. Okay, please remember, Quarshyokar is a form of extreme malnutrition. So, definitely muscle wasting is present, but the point to be noted is, you will not be able to make out the muscle wasting because it could be hidden by edema. It is hidden by edema. So that is why even though muscle wasting is present, you will not be able to make out clinically sometimes. That is a point to be noted. And the characteristic appearance in the skin, which you should know about, is called as the, yes, what is that appearance is called? Yes, it is called as a flaky paint appearance. It is called as a flaky paint appearance. These are the important questions which they repeatedly ask about Quarshoka. Just, I just compile some, compile some of the previous year question and put it for you. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. A 11 year old child is found to be anemic with previous history of blood transfusion. Lab values reveal hemoglobin of 8 which is going to be low. MCV of 70 which is again low. Uh, less than 80 and all it is low. So definitely it is uh, low MCV along with low hemoglobin, MCV and MCHC are normal and you get the very classical microcytic hypochromic RBCs. So basically you are having a child who is having microcytic hypochromic anemia. The number one condition which will always strike our mind whenever there is microcytic hypochromic anemia is going to be yes iron deficiency anemia which is what I am writing in the short form as IDA. Definitely we all think about that but do you think this is iron deficiency anemia? Look at the uh, history which is given. There is a previous history of multiple blood transfusion. Remember, mul uh, iron deficiency anemia will not require multiple blood transfusion. Maybe once in a while child may require, but definitely no history of multiple blood transfusion. So that means we are dealing with some other condition, which is a close um, differential for iron deficiency anemia. That is going to be, yes, beta thalassemia. Okay. Whenever we study about beta thalassemia, there are beta thalassemia minor, beta thalassemia trait, beta thalassemia intermedia, and beta thalassemia major. What could be the uh, what could be the um, diagnosis in this particular child? Remember, it is multiple blood transfusion or what we call it as transfusion dependent thalassemia. Please remember the word transfusion dependent thalassemia is reserved only for beta thalassemia major, which would be the most possible diagnosis in this particular child okay right anyway so what 
of the which of the following investigation should be done next please remember among the given options serum ion hb electrophoresis direct comb test or osmotic rejection which is the best answer to choose very good it is going to be hemoglobin electrophoresis remember two very important investigations in the diagnosis of thalassemia or one is hemoglobin electrophoresis one more is hplc which is high performance liquid chromatography okay that is what you need to remember okay hb electrophoresis and hplc okay serum iron may not be very very helpful in diagnosis of this case even though serum iron can be elevated in children who are having multiple blood transfusion that is okay comb test is done in cases of hemolytic anemias okay especially autoimmune hemolytic anemias that is where we do the comb test osmotic fragility yes you it can be done in this scenario but it is not going to help to make a diagnosis of thalassemia as such okay so that is why those are not the preferred options for this question answer is hb electrophoresis okay thinking about possibility of beta thalassemia major in this particular child what is the reason transfusion dependent anemia in this child that's all let's move to the next question in a neonate who presented with incessant cry and irritability cyanosis was noted which subsides when the baby starts crying what should be done next okay very typical clue cyanosis is noted but when the baby starts crying the cyanosis is not there what is the meaning the child is quiet the mouth is closed child is having cyanosis when the child starts crying mouth opens and there is no cyanosis that means what air goes through the mouth so now think about like this whatever i have told you and try to tell me what could be the presentation in this child this is a typical presentation called cyclical cyanosis okay this is called cyclical cyanosis what is the meaning of cyclical cyanosis okay cyanosis present then sometime it is absent then again it is present so like a cycle it is present absent present absent so that's why it's called as a cyclical cyanosis yes now the clue is already there in front of you what is the diagnosis in this particular child yes it is going to be a case of bilateral coanal atresia remember the key word is bilateral coanal atresia it's not unilateral unilateral will have a late presentation right it is bilateral coanal atresia we all know that in coanal atresia both uh, i'm talking about bilateral coanal atresia both the posterior part of the nose is going to be blocked either by a membranous or a bony septum so effectively both the nostrils are blocked so the only way the child is able to take air inside is through the mouth and that is possible only when the baby starts crying please remember that babies are obligate nasal breathers they are not uh, they don't have the um, what to say the usual ability to breathe through the mouth they are instead nasal breathers so that is why when the nose bread block the baby faces difficulty and develops cyanosis when the baby develops cyanosis the child becomes irritable and starts crying when the child starts crying what happened the air will go through the mouth and so the cyanosis will reduce so this happens like a cycle that is what we called as cyclical cyanosis very classically associated with bilateral coanal atresia so which of the following should be done next is it endotracheal intubation nasal cpap oxygen inhalation or oropharyngeal airway insertion what is the answer for this question the answer is going to be oropharyngeal airway insertion okay please remember nasal cpap obviously is out because nose is already blocked we cannot put some nasal prongs or deliver nasal cpap it is not going to be of any use for this child oxygen inhalation alone is not going to be useful because we need the mouth to be open all the time or the oral cavity to be open only then it is going to enter inside so that's why oxygen inhalation alone will not be helpful for this particular child endotracheal intubation is a possibility which we can do or tracheostomy also we can do but the point to be noted is next is the question okay always we try to do with a minimally invasive procedure rather than putting an endotracheal tube we will first try with a minimally invasive procedure that is regarding oropharyngeal airway insertion so just like what we do in anesthesia and all no before that intubation or before the procedures and all we do that oropharyngeal airway right same thing here also we do the oropharyngeal airway or instead of an oropharyngeal airway what we can do is uh, look at this picture okay this picture is telling you about that feeding nipple what we can do is feeding nipple not just feeding nipple but feeding nipple with a large hole okay feeding nipple with a large hole or we can cut a part of the nipple so that the hole becomes 
large and what we will do is this region okay this region we will insert into the baby's mouth and and tie it with the straps so you can see that there is always an opening in this region through which the air goes inside okay this is what we call it as a megaverns technique this is what we call it as a megaverns technique remember either we can try megaverns technique or we can do oropharyngeal airway insertion oropharyngeal airway insertion as asked in this particular question okay anyone can be try to make sure that the baby airway is always filled with the air okay or to make the airway patent that is a point to be noted okay so for this particular question answer is going to be oropharyngeal airway insertion if not oropharyngeal airway you can choose the megaverns technique also okay we all know that some points about venal atresia it is due to failure of naso uh, naso buccal membrane to rupture if the membrane doesn't rupture it blocks the nostrils very simple now please remember this oropharyngeal airway or megaverns technique is only a temporary solution okay in the small baby okay once the baby grows older you have to plan a definitive procedure which could be either a trans nasal correction or a trans palatal correction of this coenal atresia please remember trans nasal technique is what is generally preferred and what is the usual age at which is done we have studied in ent itself what is that it is between 1 and 1/2 to 2 years that is the usual timing uh, at which definitive surgery is advised for these children so that's about this question let's move to the next one in an adolescent presenting with short duration illness and starvation lab evaluation reveals unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia with normal liver enzyme which condition should be suspected please remember this is an adolescent okay short duration illness and starvation okay so something not like a very chronic problem at all but um, having like a like a mild illness that's all okay but the important clue given in the question is unconjugated hyperbilirubin so he is having jaundice and that jaundice due to increase in unconjugated bilirubin what else is there he is also having normal liver enzymes so with this clue you have to rule out options and arrive at the answer please remember in this particular question what all options can be ruled out look at the last option rotor syndrome rotor syndrome is something which is characterized by increase in conjugated bilirubin so that option is automatically out okay look at the first two question chronic pancreatitis please remember in chronic pancreatitis also what can happen is some sort of obstruction to the bile flow can happen and sometimes you can get jaundice but that would be associated with increase in conjugated bilirubin so that is again out for this particular question okay it has to be either acute viral hepatitis or gilbert syndrome please remember in acute viral hepatitis there should be elevated liver enzymes right there should be elevated liver enzymes here liver enzymes are absolutely normal so that is also out so by eliminating all the other options the answer for this question is gilbert syndrome please remember some important points about gilbert syndrome gilbert syndrome is the most common inherited cause of jaundice most common inherited conditions associated with jaundice okay typically associated with increase in unconjugated bilirubin and this condition is usually intermittent that means in between in between only the patient is going to have jaundice not as a permanent jaundice in the patient okay intermittent jaundice say like for example in this particular question it is given the child was having a short duration illness or a starvation that can precipitate the jaundice but once he recovers from the illness jaundice also will settle down okay that is what i meant by intermittent jaundice second point to be noted is it does not affect the liver in other ways as you can see from the finding of normal liver enzyme so that is why this is also one of the benign conditions associated with jaundice okay so you need not actively treat this condition that's what i meant by benign variety of jaundice okay so all these are important other important points which can be asked in your future exam so do make a note of it answer for this question is gilbert syndrome let's move to the next question a child is presenting with short stature growth hormone levels were found to be high but igf1 levels are low what is the likely abnormality remember in a child with short stature and something related to growth hormone we are suspecting growth hormone deficiency right 
but here growth hormone levels on the contrary are found to be high always always remember whenever we suspect a problem endocrine problem where we are expecting low levels of hormone but that surprisingly that hormone level is found to be high we always think about resistance to the action of hormone that is what you need to remember resistance to the action of hormone okay some resistance to the action of hormone in this particular situation happens to be resistant to the action of growth hormone you see here growth hormone is produced from the pituitary it acts on the liver via its receptors okay here is a problem okay please remember once growth hormone acts on the receptor the liver will start releasing insulin like growth factor one which is going to cause the effects of growth hormone this is what we are studying in normal physiology okay right effects of growth hormone are mediated by igf1 after being released from the liver now what is the condition we are dealing with where the growth hormone levels are high the problem is the receptors are not responding that is what we call it as resistance to the action of growth hormone okay right when the receptors are not going to be responding what is going to happen the igf1 level automatically will decrease igf1 level will automatically decrease that is very well understood right so this condition is actually a case of growth hormone resistance causing short stature and what do you call this condition you call this condition as leron's dwarfism leron's dwarfism okay right so what is the answer the answer is going to be growth hormone receptor defect which is option c for this particular question okay right let's move on to the uh, next question gum bleeding is seen in deficiency of straight forward question you cannot go wrong here this is a very important we always say that in the classes this is a classical feature of vitamin c deficiency okay we all know that the other just a quick look about the other option vitamin k deficiency results in something called a bleeding disorder when we put up in the pediatric perspective it's called hemorrhagic disease of newborn what we call it as hdn hemorrhagic disease of newborn that is due to vitamin k deficiency which classically presents as gastrointestinal bleeds in the newborn okay like hematemesis melina or blood in the stools like that okay that's how it generally presents okay vitamin b3 is niacin deficiency which is going to be typically manifesting as pellagra diarrhea dermatitis and dementia okay then vitamin d deficiency is going to manifest as rickets okay anyway all the other options are not going to be the answer answer is vitamin c deficiency scurvy we all know three classical manifestations of bleeding which occur in scurvy very important again i will just revise it quickly one is the gum bleed okay they can have small petechiae as well as small ecchymosis or, or or small purpura also not very distinguishing feature distinguishing features are one is gum bleed second is you can see that surrounding the hair follicle there are small small minute bleeds what we call it as peri follicular bleeds that is a number two characteristic bleeding associated with this peri follicular bleeds number 3 is that they can have subperiosteal bleeds they can have subperiosteal bleeds i am talking about bleeding in the bones subperiosteal bleeds and because of bleeding in the bones the child's bones become that area becomes very tender and child may not move the limb at all what you call it as pseudo paralysis okay pseudo paralysis okay right these are the three typical manifestation of scurvy which you should always know about let's move to the next question a male infant is brought with a complaints of abdominal distension and chronic constipation which was noted uh, which was sorry which was not treated sorry for that which was not treated with any medications before there is a history of not passing meconium for more than 48 hours after birth which of the following would be appropriate management for this child please remember in a child having abdominal distension constipation along with that a very very important clue is given not passing meconium for more than 48 hours after birth which condition should strike your mind it is a condition of hirschsprung disease it is a condition of hirschsprung disease and not anything else it is very classical hirschsprung disease you all know that in hirschsprung disease there is absence of ganglion what we call it as a ganglionosis and it is classically associated with constipation and delay in the passage of meconium okay 
So possible diagnosis here is Hirschsprung disease. So which should be appropriate management for this particular child? To look for the absence of ganglion, you are going to do rectal biopsy. It's again one more straightforward question. You should know about the presentations of Hirschsprung disease and what is Hirschsprung disease. It is an absence of ganglion in the layers of the intestine. What is the most common area to be affected? The most common area to be affected is a rectum. So that is why we are going to take a rectal biopsy to establish our diagnosis in this particular case. Again, a straightforward question. Let's move on to the next question. A seven-year-old school child presented with a history of recurrent staring episodes. These events last for about 20 seconds and terminate abruptly. Which of the following drug will be helpful in this situation? Okay, very classical clue. This is a school going child. Okay, presenting with recurrent starry. Sometimes they can ask you, child is not attentive or inattentive in the class. Like that they can give you the history. Inattentive in the class, recurrent starring episode. Something like, uh, some used to describe like the child is having a complaint of daydreaming in the class. Something like that. Okay, and please note that these are all... Uh, uh, events of very short duration. Can you see that about 20 seconds? That is what is given in the question. Okay, it can be even lesser than that. Okay, the thing is, child will have multiple episodes of that short events. So, what does this description suggest to of? This is very very classically suggest to of a type of seizure called absence seizures. Absence seizures. So, this question is framed in such a way to make you think about absence seizure. And now the question becomes simplified. What is the drug in the management of absence seizure? Very classical. What is the drug of choice for management of absence seizure? I told this so many times in the class. Drug of choice is going to be valproate. Without any doubt, it's always valproate. Any age group, now valproate is the drug of choice. If not valproate is given, what is the second choice drug? The second choice drug is going to be lamotrigine. That is a point to be noted. Okay, right. So valproate is the drug of choice for this particular scenario and the answer for this question. But there was one more question about seizures as well, which I'll tell you in a while. A 10 year old child presents with a rash in lower limbs along with complaints of abdominal and joint pain. Lab findings reveal hematuria with normal platelet count. What is the likely diagnosis? Please remember that again, a small child, a rash in the lower limbs. Remember, key description is rash only in the lower limbs. See, whenever we study about rash in children and all, it can affect the limbs, but both upper and lower limbs will be affected. Here, what is the question? Rash in the lower limbs, it is something like gravity dependent downward areas only affected. That is the first clue to be noted. Second clue is presence of abdominal and joint pain. In a child with rash in the lower limb along with abdominal and joint pain, along with that, some involvement of the kidney in the form of hematuria, which suggests glomerulonephritis. Which condition should strike your mind among the options? HSP, IG nephropathy, ITP, PSGN. Please remember, in PSGN, you can have hematuria, but what is the need for the rash or the abdominal joint pain that is out? Same, IgA nephropathy also associated with uh, nephritis-like presentation, but it won't be associated with abdominal joint pain or rash and all. That is also out. ITP can be associated with rash, but you can see very clearly it is given normal platelet count. ITP will be obviously thrombocytopenic purpura, that should be low platelet count, right? So again, that is not the answer for the question. Straightforward answer is Hinoxonlein purpura. This is the typical presentation of that rash in Hinoxonlein purpura. It is actually a palpable purpura, which is characteristic. It is actually palpable purpura, which is characteristic. Generally, when we study about purpura, okay, it is commonly due to thrombocytopenia, low platelet count. But in this particular condition, as given in the question, it is not due to platelet deficiency child is developing purpura. Um, so it is going to be associated with a normal platelet count. So what is actually HSP? Yes, HSP is actually a vasculitis. Correct. HSP is actually a vasculitis. To be very clear, it's a small vessel vasculitis. That is a point to be noted. Okay. That can manifest with the palpable purpura. That can also manifest with um, this abdominal pain, joint pain in a small child. Okay, and very important clue which is given, asked in the question, which immunoglobulin deposition is noted in this vasculitis? It is IgA deposition. That is also a commonly asked MCQ question which you should make a note of. Right, moving on to the next question. 
this is what is one more question uh, about a child with seizure this time it is about febrile seizure in a child with febrile seizure what is the first line drug to control seizure always remember any child uh, in um, um, with seizure in front of you what is the first drug you are going to give to terminate the seizure it is going to be a form of benzodiazepine and among the given options uh, the benzodiazepine is midazolam and hence going to be the answer for this particular question okay please remember phenytoin is going to be the second line drug okay after that only if still not controlled we will use valproate so if you look at the order one first drug would be benzodiazepine second drug would be phenytoin third drug would be valproate in the setting of pediatric seizures okay phenobarbital usually doesn't have a uh, initial role in the management of seizure in which scenario phenobarbital is a drug of choice it is only in neonatal seizures that's an important point to be noted only in neonatal seizures phenobarbital is the drug of choice that's also an important mcq of an afternoon year exams move on to the next question menkes disease is associated with okay of course some of you might have read about this in your metabolic disorders and all a very important question um, for your exams or for the upcoming exams also it is a condition of yes it's a condition of copper deficiency it's a condition of copper deficiency generally when we study about copper another condition comes to our mind which is wilson's disease okay wilson disease is also something which is related to the menkes disease but there are some differences i'll tell you how generally remember menkes disease is a condition which is characterized by a genetic defect in atp7 a gene defect very important point whereas when we look at wilson when we look at the wilson disease wilson disease characterized by atp7 b gene defect that is number 1 number 2 menkes disease inheritance is x linked recessive x linked recessive whereas Wilson disease the mode of inheritance is autosomal recessive that is a point to be noted okay what is the abnormality in menkes disease in menkes disease what happens um copper transport across the intestine is decreased think like this uh, from the intestine the copper has to be transported into the body or into the blood that is going to be defective in case of menkes disease so what happens in menkes disease actually there is deficiency of copper as well as deficiency of ceruloplasmin whereas in case of wilson disease what happen the ceruloplasmin level is low the ceruloplasmin level is low but in the body there is increased amount of free copper which is going to cause toxicity in case of wilson disease whereas in menkes disease the copper is low that is a point to be noted what are the characteristic features clinical features of menkes disease which you need to remember you can see that the hair is appearing whitish it is not a very strong hair what we call it as a fragile hair as well as it is something which is uh, very very uh, what to say irregularly arranged that is what we call it as a kinky hair that is why the name of this disease is called as a menkes kinky hair disease okay and if the hair is seen under microscopy it will show fracture of the hair shaft it will show fracture of the hair shaft that is why you can see something like that kinkiness is present as given in the picture okay it is fracture of the hair shaft what we call it as a trichor axis this is what we call it as trichor axis a very classical finding which is a potential uh, future question which you should make a note of this is called trichor axis which is nothing but fracture of the hair shaft this makes the hair to be appearing as a kinky appearance that is a point to be noted these are all other points about this menkes disease which you should know for your exams moving on which of the following is noted in infant of a diabetic mother a very very standard question no uh, is it hypoglycemia hyperglycemia hypoglycemia or hypoinsulinemia yes it is obviously a uh, hypoglycemia okay please remember that what happens is um, in a infant of a diabetic mother what happens is in the fetus i'm talking about intrauterine life what happens is lot of sugar is there in the mother due to diabetes that sugar comes into the baby and cause hyperglycemia inside the baby i'm talking about intrauterine life okay as a result of hyperglycemia in the intrauterine environment the fetus 
will start producing lot of insulin. So in this particular condition, actually there is not hypoinsulinemia but hyperinsulinemia. Are you able to follow this? Right. Now let us imagine after birth. After birth, what happened? The placenta is cut off. So the sugar coming from the mother is going to be completely out. But this hyperinsulinemia can persist for some time inside the baby after birth. And that hyperinsulinemia is going to result in development of hypoglycemia in this baby. Okay. So that is why we always keep monitoring sugar in a baby born to a diabetic mother. In fact, some of the babies can even develop hypoglycemic seizures as well. That is why we should always keep monitoring a child born to a diabetic mother for hypoglycemia. And the answer for this question is very straightforward. Let's move on to the next question. Dose of folic acid to be administered during pregnancy for prevention of neural tube defect to a mother with previous birth of a child with neural tube defect. What is that? Please remember this question is not just about the dose of folic acid during pregnancy but in a mother who has previous child with neural tube defect. Please remember when the mother has a previous child with neural tube defect, the risk of next child having neural tube defect is increased. That is a point to be noted. So that is why uh, when you give folic acid, you have to give it in increased dose. The usual dose of folic acid is 0.4 mg during pregnancy or 400 microgram. But that will not be the answer for this question. Okay. For this question, you have to give an increased dose. I have told you, right? So how much is the increased dose? It is 10 times 0.4. That is 4 milligram or equivalent to 4000 microgram. So when the mother has a previous affected child, for the next pregnancy, you have to give 10 times the usual dose. That is a learning point to be noted. Okay, right. Let's move on to the next question. Which of the following is not true about cholesterol? Contains IgA. See, cholesterol is the first milk which is secreted 3 to 4 days after birth. We all know that. Okay, this is the appearance of the cholesterol. You see that it is uh, yellowish, slightly yellowish. Okay. Right? It is also more thicker when compared to the mature one. Okay? It is more thicker, more yellowish and the quantity as such is little lesser. Quantity as such is little less when compared to the mature one. Okay? Right. Now go back to the options. Contains immunoglobulin A. Definitely very important. Cholesterol contains lot of immunoglobulin, especially immunoglobulin A as well as immunocompetent cell. That is a very true statement. Just now I have told you it is slightly yellowish in color. So lemon yellow color is also a correct statement about cholesterol. Question is whether it is rich in protein and amino acid or it has got high amounts of sugar and fat. Correct answer is it is definitely rich in protein and amino acid. It is also rich in uh, fat soluble vitamins that is vitamins A, D, E and K. Okay, it is also rich in fat soluble vitamin A, D, E and K. So what would be the uh, incorrect statement about cholesterol? It is high amount of sugar and fat. Actually what happens is in the initial cholesterol there is less amount of sugar and fat and after that 3 to 4 days only the sugar and fat content increases. You can see this line from Opigai textbook. Milk secreted after 3 to 4 days. What happens is immunoglobulin and protein content would decrease but very important fat and the sugar content would increase. So that means what? Only that mature milk, there is more fat and more sugar in comparison to cholesterol. So that is why the answer for this question is option D. High amount of sugar and fat is not a property of cholesterol. It is after the cholesterol. Okay, When the mature milk develops, well, that time only it contains high amount of sugar and fat. So that is the answer for this question. Let's move on to the final question in the pediatric section. It's a very straightforward question. Dystrophin protein is absent. Please remember dystrophin protein is related to two of the options given in the question. One is Becker's muscular dystrophy. One more is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Please remember the clue is where it is absent. It is completely absent in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That is a point to be noted. Whereas in Becker's muscular dystrophy, it is not completely absent. It is present but it is not fully functional. It is Partially functional dystrophin. That is what is 
Becker's muscular dystrophy. It's a partially functional dystrophin, not absent dystrophin. It's a very straightforward question actually. Okay, that is why we always say that Becker's muscular dystrophy is like a milder variant of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That is the point to be noted. Anyway, answer is Duchenne dystrophin protein is absent in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One important point is that it is an X-linked recessive disorder. So, only males are going to be affected by this particular condition. Okay, that is something which you should know about. So, with that, we complete the discussion of FMG December 2021 questions in pediatric. I hope that this discussion was useful for you. If there are any suggestions about the actual question asked in the exam or the options for that question, please do put up in the comment section. Uh, if you like this video, please share it with your friends and any um, any queries or about the question or, uh, or other aspects of pediatrics, please leave a comment section. I will be happy to reply. Soon I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.